When it comes to air quality, the bad news is that wildfires and air pollution have really degraded the quality of our air. But the good news is that we're all realizing that the quality of our air, and particularly the quality of our indoor air, is really darn important. I'm so excited to tell you about Puro Air because in 30 minutes, this device will remove allergens, dust, smoke, and gases from your room. It uses a stronger type of filter called a HEPA-14, and it filters pollutants at a microscopic level. I keep my Puro Air running upstairs where the bedrooms are all night. I love that it's quiet. Cleaner air just hits different, doesn't it? Check out everything Puro Air has to offer at getpuroair.com. That's G-E-T-P-U-R-O-A-I-R.com. One more time for the people in the back, getpuroair.com. Well, hello and welcome back. My name is Stephanie Safarian and you're listening to episode 444. That, by the way, is my favorite number, 444, of Sustainable Minimalists. This is a show about intentional and eco-friendly minimalist living. It is 2024, surprise to no one, and yet still, even though we're in 2024, traditional gender norms remain in many of our households. And so on today's show, we're hoping to change that. Today's show is about teaching our children what We want them to know about partnership so that they can grow up and start their own homes with equality in mind. That unpaid labor, also known as housework, tends to, at least in this household, still be the woman's job, the woman's work, but it doesn't need to be. So today, my guest is Lori Sugarman Lee. She is a certified fair play facilitator. She's a family coach, and she's also the author of the new children's book coming out soon. It's called Our Home, The Love, Work, and Heart of Family. Today, we seek to release ourselves of gender norms, especially if those norms aren't serving us, as we engage children and our partners partners in that unpaid work, the work of the home. Lori, I am so happy to have you on the show. How are you? I'm great. I've been so looking forward to chatting. Thanks for having me. You are so welcome. Why don't we start by you telling us who you are and why you wrote the new book, Our Home? Okay, super. I am Lori Sugarman Lee. I am a debut children's book author and certified fair play facilitator and family coach. I'm based here in Chicago, and I came to this work really through a huge bubble bursting moment in my own life and in my own perception of value and the value that I was contributing to the universe, to my community. I had a 15-year paid career in marketing strategy, which I really loved. And at the end of my career, I was working for Four Seasons Hotels and Resorts, which, as you can imagine, was a fabulous job when you don't have children to look after. But when I had my first baby, it was really like a complicated model. And at that time, there wasn't an openness to flexibility in my role. And so I decided to go all in on unpaid work, which is which full-time care of my then one child, two years later, two children, and all in on community work and volunteer contributions and charity work, et cetera. I brought to that the same effort and intention that I had always brought to my paid career. I was very nourished by the work. My family and my community valued it very much, and I felt I was thriving in it. Our family moved twice internationally. I moved us to London, England, when my husband had a career opportunity there, and then from London to Chicago now. When we move every time, we need to renew all of our sort of foundational documents, our wills, our insurance, and all of that stuff. So when we moved to the US, we got life insurance and health insurance. And my husband said to me, let's get you disability insurance because if, God forbid, something happens to you, I'll take a leave and head up the family. So that was the value that we had for this work of care. Come to find out through the experience in dealing with the disability insurance agent who was very quick to reject me for disability insurance, saying to me, I'm sorry, but we don't value homemakers that high. And I said, I'm sorry, what? 
(laughs) He said, you don't receive a salary, so you don't fall on our algorithm. So I said, are you telling me that in the eyes of your industry, I don't have value? And he said, without saying it that way, I guess that's what I'm saying. And that moment just lit me on fire. And it led me to this awareness of this societal devaluing of this unpaid work that I loved doing so much. And I know so many women loved doing it full time or didn't love it, but had to do it full time. And then also all of my friends who worked outside the home for pay were also doing all of this work. And this idea that in the eyes of this gentleman, it had no value was really something that I couldn't pretend I didn't hear it. And I thought, what can I do? And I'm raising these two boys and I thought, okay, I don't have the platform to impact corporations. I don't necessarily have the platform to impact government policy, but I can impact families and I can speak to kids. And so I ventured out to write a children's book and here we are. I'm so excited to glean your wisdom. I'm sure as a mother of two boys, you're likely passionate about raising them in a way that they value domestic labor. And as a mother with two daughters, I want them to grow up with an understanding that the work of the home, the unpaid labor that you call it, and I love that, by the way, unpaid work as opposed to housework, I want them to know that is shared work, or it should be shared work. Surprise to know when we live in a patriarchal society. So it's the benefit of the men in power for the women to do (laughs) the unpaid, invisible work that doesn't get a paycheck. When the women are doing that work, we're really at the end of the day, or doing all the work, I should say, we're really just keeping the status quo relevant. And I'll say too, you know, when I had my first daughter, I never really thought about domestic labor until I had my daughter. I never really thought about gender roles. I never really thought about any of that until the day after my daughter was born and my husband went back to work and his life didn't change all that much, but mine changed drastically. That's it. Yeah. Go ahead. No, listen, statistics will tell us that globally women carry 75% of the load of care and domestic work. And to clarify that further, that is the measurable executional part of the work. It doesn't even count the cognitive, the mental, the emotional labor, which as we know is a massive load. And this is really becoming a wellness issue for women. Women have much higher rates than men of stress and anxiety and other wellness-related issues. And we know it's directly connected to this heavy load. And in addition to that, men have upwards of five more hours of leisure time per week than women have. And so we're not having the outlets that we need. And as I think about your daughters and the future that we want for them, We're in a time in society now where we have all the amazing children's books that tell girls, you can code, you can be president, you can go to the moon, you can fly, you can do anything. And of course they can. But what are we taking away from what we expect from them on the unpaid side to make the space for all of these dreams to come true? We have to also talk to boys, as you said, about the value of contributing to care, about the fact that they are wanted in that environment, needed and belong. And it's not gendered work. It's the work of family, of humanity. And the really at its foundation, it is gratitude for all that we have. Hmm. So we need to talk to our daughters. We need to talk to our sons. Many of us, myself included, we need to also talk to our husbands because at least my husband's going to kill me, but he grew up in a very traditional household. And so breaking the gender roles as they relate to this unpaid work has been my daughter's, that daughter that I was discussing, she's now almost 10. So it's been a decade and counting of us trying to re-navigate, let's say. 
So let's talk about family flow. What is it and how can it improve my family life? I think we all have a flow, right? And it's this is the daily cadence, right? The schedule, the rituals, the special considerations, negotiations, obligations of a family. It's how we move through the world together. And it's so fascinating if you take a minute to think about how we're organized into these families. And we have agreements that we make every day as to like where we're going to go and how we're going to get there and when we're going to eat and how we're going to meet and how we're going to support each other and how we're going to honor each other. And It's really important to be aware of how meaningful these agreements are and to understand like what the foundation of it all is. Like, how do we have to show up for one another in order to make this flow as smooth as possible? And so each family can tell their own story. They can have their own flow. And again, we talked about it all being centered in values, but in order to make it work, like you have to understand it from the inside and out. Yeah. And making sure that the flow is working for everybody. And it's exactly. not just one person making the flow work for everybody else. Right? Exactly. I think. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. And that's the beauty about including children in these conversations. Children are so thoughtful. They're so reflective and they have so much to contribute. Even little kids can understand the question, What's important to you about X or Y? What feels, when does it feel good and when does it feel hard? When does it feel stressful? What are we doing when things feel smooth? What are we doing when things feel complicated? And it's just a matter of reflecting on those things and saying, okay, like, how can we organize ourselves better, position ourselves better to not have these obstacles and to support each other optimally? Yeah, I like your emphasis there on being intentional at the forefront. So asking yourself these questions instead of just letting life take you away, <laughs> uh, being proactive as opposed to reactive. But what's step one? So step one is really talking to your family about the concept of values. Some questions like, how much rest do we need? What re- when do we feel rejuvenated? What kind of exercise and activity do we all need to have during the day? When do I get to flex my creative muscle? What about time together? When are we connecting? And then what are all the things that we need to do in a day to make all of that possible, right? Like the foundational elements. What's important to us as a family? And also what is not important to us? And this idea that This is our decision, right? And every family, every house looks different, right? Some people thrive in this kind of environment. Some people thrive in that kind of environment. Release the judgment and really look inward to understand what is important to us and what are the building blocks for that. An important part of that conversation too, as you mentioned, is how did I as a parent grow up? what am I used to? What are my beliefs? And why are these my beliefs? Am I doing these things now because that's the way my dad did it or my mom did it? Like, what's my opportunity to really understand that and potentially change it if the way that my family wants to move is different than that? There's cultural influences, right? There's where do we live in the country versus in the city versus what are our responsibilities? Do we have one spouse who travels extensively? There's all sorts of considerations that make up the unique flow of a family. And it's really about being more intentional. I, I, we're going to use this word a hundred times, I think, during our conversation, but also like being more like being louder about it. Because as you said, so much of the work that runs a family is invisible. And that actually doesn't serve. I can tell you, when I was a young mom, my husband and I made this agreement because the workplace that I wanted to go back to wasn't offering flexibility. We made this agreement, which was very uninformed at that time, right? That he would do the paid work and I would do the unpaid work. Not realizing, of course, the scope of unpaid work, which I'm very familiar with now. But because I wanted to be like perfect about it, I would bust my butt all day long so that he would come home and everything would look 
beautiful and perfect. And so he certainly appreciated that, but he didn't understand what the effort was. He never saw it. Hmm. There's a huge opportunity for the scope of work that guides our family through daily life to be seen and understood. And only then can we apply value to it. Hmm. That speaks to me because as the person who's home all day, my children are at school, my husband most days exits the home and works elsewhere. There's so much that I I could fill my whole day just doing stuff around the house. However, when I do it all, and to be frank, it's easier when I do it because I do it the way I want and I'm fast and all that. But when I do it all, Number one, I'm not teaching my children what goes into running a home. Number two, I'm not contributing to a more equitable distribution of household labor. And number three, like nobody's even seeing what I'm doing. They don't even, they can't, I'm not even giving them the opportunity to participate in the essential matters of the home. Can I add a number four? Yes. (laughs) Number four, if you didn't have a full day of that kind of work, what else could you be doing? What else could you be doing to support your own wellness, your own creativity, your own um, health, physical health? Um, if you had that space because you knew that somebody else was in ownership of these tasks that you felt were on your plate. Hmm. I'm sure in your capacity as a fair play facilitator, you come across some uh, reticence from children and adults to step up, let's say. How do you handle those? And I just want to say that for me and my husband, the answer was therapy. (laughs) Uh, So for those of us who can't afford therapy, don't want to go to therapy, but the unpaid work is so grossly inequitable, where would they start? I will do a plug for fair play right here because this is a great entry point into this conversation. I think what therapy probably facilitated for you guys was an opportunity to change your language around this, which is such a huge part of it. And so fair play as a book, it is also a system in that it is a deck of cards that really helps to visualize the scope of the work of the home and understand the division. It's also a documentary. And so if you're not a book person and you just want to like chill out on the couch and really let this information sink into you, there's a fair play documentary, which I highly recommend. But really, it's so much about language and systems and boundaries. And the biggest change for me that I recommend for families is not only the language of how you talk about this work, but the energy that we give to this work. And I start with the word chore, right? Like the definition of the word chore is a task that is unappealing, difficult, and tedious, right? And this is the word that we use for the work of love and care and nourishing and nurturing and maintaining our investments and adhering to community standards, this work should not be dreaded. I know it's hard. I know we're often doing it when we're tired. So I'm not trying to say it's unicorns and rainbows, but this work has so much meaning. And at its foundation, as I said before, It is an expression of gratitude for all that we have. And so I think that energy around it is so critical. And the kids are seeing this, right? They're learning constantly. They're seeing how we talk about it, how we approach it. And I think that the systems that we have in place around it too, and this is really what Fair Play gets into and I get into with my coaching, but the idea of full task ownership in a family, not a division of labor that is founded in the goal of 50-50. I never talk to my families about 50-50 or a division based on numbers, but backing into it with, does everybody have an equal amount of rest, an equal amount of joy, an equal amount of time for connection and creativity? Great. So what's the balance of work that leads you to that? And then finally, approaching this 
beautiful work as an opportunity for connection in and of itself. I think so often you hear people say like, do what you have to do so you can do what you want to do, right? Which is an approach I really understand. But I would love for people to consider that, again, we don't have a better word, but chores or the tasks of home can themselves be an opportunity for family bonding and family connection and family learning and family growth. There's so many times that my son will be in the laundry room with me. We're having a blast together. I think for kids especially, they want to be near you. They want to be empowered and trusted and a part of important things. And so if you talk about the value of this work and how much it contributes and how much it means to the family when they get involved, quite possibly that they could see it differently. Yes. What you're saying there is flip the script. Don't talk about the chores or the household tasks or whatever we want to call them. Don't talk about them in doom and gloom, misery language. Talk about how doing these contributes to the flow, the family flow, right? Make it a positive thing. Make it a time to spend quality time together. That all sounds great. We're going to take a break, Lori, but when we come back, I'm going to ask you the question that I'm sure is on everybody's mind, which is, of course, what about kids who just don't want to do it? <laughs> who want to play with to that? <laughs> yeah. They want to play with their Legos and read their book and play with their friends outside instead. So I'm going to ask you that after a quick sponsor break. Are you looking for that perfect gift for someone special this Valentine's Day? Are you perhaps going out on a big Valentine's date and you're looking for that outfit? Whatever you're doing this Valentine's Day, Quince has you covered with luxury essentials at affordable prices. Quince offers a range of high-quality items. The prices are within reach, like 100% Mongolian cashmere sweaters from $50. Yes, I have one. It is my favorite sweater in my closet. And yes, Quince partners directly with top factories, and so they're cutting out the cost of the middlemen. And even better, Quince only works with factories that use safe and ethical and responsible manufacturing practices. Give yourself or others the gift of luxury this Valentine's Day with Quince. Go to quince.com slash sustainable podcast for free shipping on your order and 365 day returns. Quince.com slash sustainable podcast. Listeners, if you're like me, you are committed to living a greener and simpler life. If that sounds like you, I would love to introduce you to Home Threads. Home Threads is your ally because it is a total destination for decor and furniture. HomeThreads.com helps you discover furniture that not only complements your minimalist lifestyle, but also respects the planet. You can find thoughtfully crafted pieces that use sustainable materials without compromising on style. I have an outdoor bench from Home Threads, and I love that it's made of acacia wood. It is sturdy. It is strong. It's meant to last. And more importantly, it's made with renewable materials. No synthetics to be found here. Create a home that reflects your commitment to the environment. Visit homethreads.com slash sustainable for 15% off your first order. Home Threads, love where you live. You trust your water filter pitcher to make your tap water safe to drink, but is it really doing anything? Most filters just can't remove gross contaminants like bacteria and parasites and PFAS and microplastics. I could go on and on. I trust my water filter pitcher for water that's safe for my family to drink, and if the brand I bought isn't doing what it advertised to do, that makes me feel so frustrated. Enter LifeStraw Home. LifeStraw Home is the kitchen upgrade you will wish you made years ago. It's the only water pitcher that filters out over 30 contaminants. Most importantly, LifeStraw fights for the planet and gives back. It's a glass pitcher, and for every one sold, a child in need receives a year of safe water. Better filtration, better taste, better design. LifeStraw Home products can be found at LifeStraw.com or Amazon. And we're back. Today I'm speaking with Lori Sugarman Lee. She is a certified 
Fair Play facilitator and family coach. She is also the author of the new book, Out Soon. It's her debut book. Congratulations. It's called Our Home, The Love, Work, and Heart of Family. So, Lori, before the break, we talked about changing language around chores, incorporating kids, making it quality time. Um, I think what you were saying, too, is connecting the task to a why, to, to really get the kids on board. But still, I have an almost 10-year-old, and getting her to do anything in this house is a real battle. How could you help me? I think one opportunity is to really understand where your kids feel passionate and empowered. And this will set them up for success and engagement with whatever task they take on. Obviously, the first step in connecting kids with contributions around the home is that the work is safe and age-appropriate for them. But beyond that, it's really about matching to their interests and matching to their skills and formulating this sense of empowerment and pride. And so I break it down into specific skills. So I have one son who's really good at organizing. So the things that I invite him in on really leverage that skill. So he's my guy who unloads the groceries and organizes the pantry. My older son is a very boisterous eater. So he tends to leave a lot of delightful little crumbs. So he's the vacuum guy in the kitchen floor. I also recommend connecting to passion. So if you have a child who's passionate about eating and food, get them involved in recipe selection or cooking skills. And then also understanding if kids are not engaging because They have concerns about their ability to complete a task and maybe invite them in on things where there is like a partnership opportunity. So if a child thrives more when they have support or like a a shadow, maybe have them do laundry with you or yard work with you. So you have that togetherness time and they understand that if they can't complete something, they have someone there who can walk them through it. And I just want to be clear, like this is really not as much about pawning work off onto kids, right? It's not about that at all. Like we want them to enjoy this and thrive in this. It's really about empowerment and teaching and opportunities for connection. One of the big things that I talk about that you mentioned is the why behind the work. And this sometimes is really helpful in helping kids to understand why things are meaningful And it takes down that barrier between them and the task. So my 13-year-old, for example, if I were to say to him, okay, we we have to change your sheets, he might groan. Like, how annoying is that? Dealing with that fitted sheet, so annoying. But if I explain it to him and say, hey, I just want to let you know that having clean sheets and clean pillowcases on your bed really contributes to having clear skin. So I was just thinking that maybe we could set up like every Monday we change your sheets or something like that. What do you think? Then it's, oh, like I'm definitely changing my sheets. Yes, that is meaningful to me. I totally get it. If you have littler kids and something that you want to get them involved in, for example, is going through their old toys and maybe doing some kind of a purge where you can do a big donation. You don't want to frame that up for them as like things are being taken away from them. But the opportunity for them with the why is really help them understand where these things are going. And the beautiful second and third life of these objects, right? When we care for them and when we find a new home for them and who are the children that will be playing with them next and what do we wish for these kids, right? And so then it becomes, oh, doing something important. I'm like, I'm so excited for my toy to have a second life, right? So it's all about, again, you said it perfectly, flipping the script. The third example that I use is about understanding how to maintain the value of large investments, right? For example, our car. So if you have kids that are dropping granola bars on the bottom of the car, whatever, and you want to help them understand why it's better that we don't necessarily do that, or not even younger kids of any age leaving stuff in the car, help them understand like, We have an opportunity probably in about a few years to sell this vehicle. And if we look after it, 
we're going to maintain the value to like a higher degree. And that means probably getting a better price for it, which then our family can do X, Y, and Z with that. And then this car is going to last for five years longer in the world. And what's the impact of that? So just really talking about, it's not just about don't make a mess in the car. It's like, why? Right? Why don't we want to make a mess? And what is the long-term implication of that? It's less nagging and more explaining the why. That's what I hear you saying. Because as a parent, it's so easy to get into the nagging cycle. But when we find ourselves in the nagging cycle, step back, take a breath, and explain the why. That's exactly it. And, you know, it helps us. When I hear myself saying it sometimes, it helps me relax and reframe the work, too. And again, doing laundry at 11 o'clock at night is not the greatest, right? But if you're able to flip it in your mind, I'm so lucky that I have this machine in my own house. I'm so lucky that my kids are a part of this amazing soccer program that they get filthy in. Just reframe it as, okay, like reset. What's the bigger picture here? And get to it. Mm. So I have a lot of thoughts in my mind, Lori. I've been like taking lots of notes as you were talking. You mentioned that inviting in our partner, our children into opportunities to participate in this unpaid work, it provides great opportunities for connection. I would say also it provides great opportunities for cycle breaking. And I'm thinking specifically about how our own childhoods, how what we saw our parents doing or not doing impacts our behavior today. I grew up primarily in a single parent household. My mother did everything. My sister and I did chores, but what was the lesson I learned? It is that the parent, the woman, (laughs) does all the things and holds the job and is stressed out, but does it all because there's nobody else. My husband on the other side, he had a mother who was... uh, I don't know. I didn't grow up in the house, but I would guess she did the vast lion's share of this unpaid work, but she enjoyed it. So she did it all with joy. What did my husband learn from that childhood? He learned that I mean, I'm, I'm speaking for him, but, and I could be completely wrong, but I'm guessing he learned that the house is women's work and women love it. <laughs> yeah. And, and that's a, a societal belief on a very high level. Yeah. And so I love the idea that now as parents ourselves, we can break those cycles if those cycles need breaking, if they're not working for us. My question here, though, becomes one that I struggle with. I talk about this with my friends all the time. It is my greatest pet peeve, let's say. I love being a mother. I don't even feel like I should have to say that. I do. However, what I don't love is being the default person, the default parent, the default this. I don't have, there's nobody below me. (laughs) So if, if something needs to get done, somebody needs to get picked up and nobody else can do it, it's always ultimately me. Does every family have a default parent? Is it usually the woman? Like, Talk to me about default parenting because it's exhausting being the default parent. Yes, it sure is. And yes, in the majority of cases in this country and in most around the world, I think, again, the woman does hold the lion's share of this. And there are all these ideas that we have believed about this, right? Like the tuition and mother knows best and baby wants mom and all of these things that we've been trained to just believe that we are better at this work and it's easier for us somehow and we are more naturally inclined to it. But I think if you look at the science and the data, which is really just starting to roll, like there's a few studies, that's not actually the case. There is no like scientific difference or difference in women and men's brains that indicate that a woman is better at multitasking, right? Or a woman is more capable of care or any of these things that we've grown to believe. And so, yes, the cycle breaking is is critical, especially as you look at your daughters and, and I look at my sons. And so it's really all about starting these conversations, right? To say like, I can feel my stress levels are impacted by this. I haven't had 
the the same leisure time that that you have had if you look at a fair play deck of cards or whatever it is that shows you the scope of this work because it's so easy to move through a day just checking all the boxes and not even reflecting on how much you've done but if you lay it all out on the table and say look at all these things that we do as a family look at the percent of the cards that i hold like it's too heavy it doesn't feel right. It doesn't feel not 50 50, but balanced in a way that is healthy for our family. And I, you know, you see resentment creeping in, see stress creeping in. And these are the families that I coach, right? Loving families who can see these resentments creeping in based on inequity and based on that feeling of unfairness and imbalance. And The only way to deal with it is by talking about it. And so it's really about explaining how much in a loud way, like I'm not sure if you guys realize, but this is all that goes on here during a day. Your kids always have socks that fit. There's always toilet paper. There's always fruit, right? Like all these things that are ticker taping through your head constantly that no one else can see because it's invisible and it's hidden and you're just making it silently and magically happen. We have to start to share all of that so that the people around you can understand the impact because ultimately you're going to feel less weighted and less stressed as soon as you share that information. And again, to be clear to the husbands and kids, It's not about you having more. The ultimate goal with applying new systems to the way that your family flows is that this work as a whole takes up less space for your family because it's done more efficiently. It's actually less ominous and less voluminous. And there is more time for the things that we label as fun. Now, not that this stuff can't be fun. And we've talked about that a little bit. Sometimes it can, but it's really the goal is how do we impart systems in our family such that this work is a smaller portion of what we spend our time doing, a more efficient portion. And when I was preparing to talk to you and to frame this stuff up in a sustainable, minimalist way, I really thought about what are we doing here? We're minimizing stress. We're minimizing, as you said a couple of minutes ago, nagging. But also, we're minimizing duplication of effort, right? That's a huge one. When somebody in the family owns a task from like start to end, you minimize that duplication. You minimize the like checking in. Have you done it? Have you done it? Have you done it? You minimize feelings of disconnection. You're minimizing exhaustion and overwhelm and you're decluttering really your mind. You're decluttering your schedule and you're decluttering what we've referred to as this family flow by adding intention and gratitude. Hmm. So one final question for you, Lori. I have had the experience in my own family in which, you know, a change is made. And at the beginning, everybody's really excited and on board. But as the days and weeks go by, slowly, we're all reverting to the status quo. My question here is, how are we keeping our partners accountable nicely, gently, nicely accountable? What about keeping our kids accountable? I'm thinking like, what are your thoughts on chore charts? Chore charts? Wow, that's uh, some alliteration there. (laughs) So accountability, talk to me about it. Right. So I think what's really important and what I recommend to the families that I speak with is that they institute a regular check-in. And so if it needs to be weekly, if it needs to be monthly, like whatever the cadence is that's right for your family, And that this check-in is a special time. And so you will do it at a time that's not a frenetically crazy time in your family when everybody can be relaxed and connected. And depending on the age of your kids, you'll set it up. So if you have younger kids, maybe there's like a special blanket that you all sit under when you sit on the floor and you have this connection time. Or there's a special treat that you love as a family that you will allocate to this check-in time. Like maybe it's pizza night or ice cream night or whatever it is that you love. And then you can also have, depending if your kids are 
um, ready for this, you can have rotating ownership of this connection time. And so there could be like a special thing that is held by the speaker that goes around the circle and everybody takes turns leading. And so it's not always on mom to be the one to say, okay, family meeting, we have to talk about chores again. But really, there is accountability and ownership by everyone in the family to lead this conversation and to reconnect. And the beautiful thing about the systems that you may implement is they can change at any time, right? They can, even if you're someone who takes on a task and says, okay, I'm going to own garbage, right? If you're doing this for three months and you're like, all right, I'm, I need somebody to, to own garbage now. Like, I, it's too stinky and I'm done. I don't want to do this anymore. So that, of course, that can change. Like, all of these things are organic. And when you know better, you do better. As you learn more about what your family needs, like, you can shift things around. But it's really important to regularly connect and prioritize these conversations. And then the other thing that I want to just add is it's really valuable to talk with each member of the family about what's important to them about their own space, how they thrive. I am somebody maybe like you who thrives in a great amount of order. I love for things to be like organized and put away. My older son does not share that. He is very nostalgic. He loves being surrounded by things that harken back memories and connect him to friends far away. And he likes to see his trophies and he likes to have special pieces of paper that have things written on them that he likes to remember and all of his stuff around him. And so instead of me enforcing my standard on his space, for example, we set a standard that works for how he thrives. And so what is his best self and his best space? And that's what he adheres to. And so that also helps them understand that it's not about what, as you said at the beginning, what one person wants, but it's about like really understanding what every family member needs to thrive in your space respecting that, also respecting how we are wired differently to approach tasks and complete tasks and whatever support we need there. And again, constantly reconnecting on this. How's it going? Are you finding this manageable? Are you finding this is working for you? I'm not fine. I'm struggling with this or whatever. And it's just like any organization does, right? When you work for a business or an organization, you have a weekly team meeting. It's super helpful to connect and update on how things are going. What were the wins? What were the challenges? And if you approach your family that way, you're going to see an increased level of efficiency and a decreased level of stress and resentment. Yes, I love that. And I'm just thinking about how, you know, this family check-in, this weekly meeting, whatever we're calling it, it doesn't have to be that serious. It doesn't have to be another thing on the calendar that we have to check off. I'm just thinking like that could be done very easily once a week around the dinner table. Quick little check-in, what's working, what's not. And then we move on to talking about, you know, our highs and lows for the day. And then it's done. And if we're proactive in that way as well, uh, mom's not going to have all these little micro resentments that culminate in her blowing up because <laughs> that, that happens in my house. <laughs> in many houses. <laughs> many, you are not alone. <laughs> all right. I'm going to try all your suggestions. I'm going to change my language. We're going to explain the why. We're going to have our check-ins. Such great advice. Lori, tell us more about where we can find you, your book, when it comes out. Tell us all the things. Oh, thanks so much. So I share a lot about how my family works through these opportunities on my Instagram account, which is at Our Home, Our Pride. And that is not about pride and perfection, but about pride in whatever your space needs to be for your family and releasing judgment. And my book is going to be available everywhere books are sold. And it's available now for pre-order. So I would love to know what people think it ships in April. Awesome. Lori, thank you so much for your time. You've given me a lot of things to think about, yes, but more importantly, a lot of tangible tips that I can start incorporating into my family's life tonight. So thank you so much. I'm so glad. It was really great to speak with you. Thank you. Listeners, that's a wrap, my friends. Show notes are at mamaminimalist.com forward slash 444. Quick little housekeeping issues. If you like the show, please leave it a review. 
That's the number one way you can support it. And thank you. And on Thursday's episode, we're talking all things seafood and fish. If you frequent the fish counter at your supermarket, how can you buy more ethically, buy smarter, buy like a conscious consumer? That's Thursday's episode and it is comprehensive. So I will see you then. Reach out if you need me and take care.